Welcome everybody to Bacon and Coffee and we're going to get started today. We have a great show. We've got a repeat guest who's always here and always willing to jump on no matter where he is in the world. His name is Mark S.A. Smith. But before we get started, we're going to do our 30 second countdown. All right, all right, all right. And here comes our caffeine and pork theme song. All right, welcome everybody to, to Bacon and Coffee. Thank you, sir. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Bacon and Coffee. And um, we are today going to be talking with Mr. Marcus A. Smith. If you haven't seen him, he's with Bija Co. Bija Co. Close enough. And, Close enough. Yeah. And he is a world traveler. So, where in the world is Carmen Santiago named Marcus A. Smith today? <laughs> I am in northern Utah. I've been exploring Utah, as uh, I, I, I've done for the past couple of years. And um, yesterday, we saw dinosaurs, lots and lots of weird dinosaurs. Uh, wow. We soaked in the Crystal Hot Spring. And today, we are uh, we just hiked up Perry Canyon, where we found a mine that was put in in 1910 we were able to crawl back in it's a hard rock mine wow where uh, somebody thought they could get rich and they didn't but it was a really interesting experience to crawl through this uh, hard rock mine that's 120 years old and then later today we're going to go out to the golden spike site where in 1865 the final spike was driven to the trans uh, u.s um, railroad which absolutely changed everything as far as the economics of the United States were concerned. Absolutely. Prior to that time, it would take you months to get across the nation, and it turned into days to get across the nation. And we'll also see later today the uh, Morton Thiokol Rocket Garden, where the hmm. rockets were created that that, that uh, protects our country and man on the moon and all those other, other things are only a few miles away from the Golden Spike site. Wow. And what I think is absolutely amazing is 100 years later from the Golden Spike being driven, man stepped on the moon almost 100 years to the day. Wow. And these two sites are very close together. So there's there's some fun, exciting exploration going on. Ah, plus, uh, you might want to Google this. This is pretty mind-blowing. We're going to go mm -hmm. see the Spiral Jetty, which is an art installation done in the 70s out into the Great Salt Lake. And we'll be spending some time there today. And then we'll soak in Crystal Hot Springs later tonight. So uh, that, <laughs> well, you that's know, the adventure that's going on right now, my friend. You are you're always so bored. Uh, you got nothing to do with yourself. <laughs> and, but I have to ask you, did you find a casino in that hard rock mine? Because uh, I think of it as the original hard rock cafe. Uh, well, uh, we did see some crystals, but we didn't see any, no guitars, no. No guitars, no, 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 no blackjack tables, none of that kind of no stuff? Black, no, no, none of that stuff. No, they, they'd already mm. lost all their bets, took their money and left, but. Uh, mm. definitely an interesting experience uh, I had, I've never been in an abandoned mine, well, most of them are, are closed off right. in the public but this one was safe enough that you could go back in it and they leave it open hmm. well and today what I wanted to talk about, there's a handful of topics that I wanted to discuss and the reason I thought this was perfect for you and for us is I was at a meeting earlier this week uh, it was one of my first face to face meetings and it was the first time I've ever been with this group of people so I didn't know them, they didn't know me. But the prevailing thing that I heard from a lot of them is we're looking for people. We're, we're losing people, yes. we're having a hard time replacing them. And, you know, obviously, I mean, there's there's all kinds of different, you know, 
theories stuff going on you know uh you know unemployment is is slowly kind of inching its way back to a level that's going to be better but you know the pay is higher and 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 you know one of the things i was just listening to another radio show that was talking about remote work and the one thing the pandemic proved is that um, businesses can function with people in other places. They don't all have to be congregated in an office. Although that has advantages, there are some advantages other way too. So what I wanted to, um, I want to discuss kind of three core topics and I know you've got a bunch of stuff too. Um, the first one being, you know, what is this new economy that we're sitting into? How do people find good quality people now? And the second piece, which obviously, you know, uh, I'm big into is can a company actually market itself to find good people, not just go, you know, work for us, but, you know, kind of given a kind of show some different ideas about why people would want to work there. And then the third one is what does this new remote economy look like? So I'm going to pass it over to you and let you start with what you had on your sheet and where you want to go with this, or at least kind of kick <laughs> us off. <laughs> All right. Well, 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 thank you, Brian. Uh, well, I, I want to I want to take things down to root cause to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's the kind of guy that I am. My engineering background says let's take a look look at root cause, not at symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the symptom is people don't want to. Uh, it's hard to find good people to work. All right, so that's the symptom. Uh, the root cause actually is three components. Um, number one is the pandemic has made a lot of people who are on the edge of being lazy lazy, and they've been paid to sit at home, get high watch TV, overeat, um, you know, America's put on the 50 COVID pounds because of their uh, their intemperance, their inability to the outside, and just because it was the, com the only comfort that we had. I mean, there, the, there's no judgment here. This is just what we have going on. So the, the, we, uh, we, we definitely have separated the lazy people from those who are willing to get out there and keep moving. And so um, the people who are lazy are going to continue to be lazy for as long as they possibly can because it's now become part of the lifestyle, part of their identity, and actually part of their energy. They don't have the energy to get back in, into a, a working environment. So that's the first thing, the first root cause. Second root cause is that um, all the good people are employed. And I hate to say it, but that's just absolutely true. Uh, all the good people who can find work are working. And uh, it, my clients are having a really hard time finding good people. Uh, one of my clients uh, does uh, uh, search, searches for executives, and uh, she's having a hard time uh, finding executives for a couple of reasons. One is people don't want to move because of the increases in, in housing prices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next thing is that they're rad asking for radical increases in pay. Uh, we're, we're looking at 20% increases in executive pay to get them to change jobs. Mm -hmm. And that is causing massive problems internally because the executives they're reporting to say, wait, I'm going to be hiring somebody for more than they're paying me right now. This is not, this is a problem. And, and so that, that leads to the third root cause, which is people feel right now that they're underpaid because of, of the scarcity of labor and because of the challenges that we faced. So what that leads me to is a couple of solutions for us to look at. The first one is going to shock you. You have to raise your fees right now by at least 20%. Mm -hmm. Right now, do not delay. Tuesday morning, go raise your rates by 20%. Do not delay. It's going to probably scare the living crap out of you. But you have no choice. You know, if you've been to the grocery store, you see prices have gone up. If you notice that gasoline has increased, it's almost doubled over what I paid last year in the same gas station as I traversed the nation. You know, you have got to raise your prices today. If you don't, you will not have enough money to stay in business. And your customers, some customers are going to complain. Other customers can go, oh, well, everything else is going up. You know, I, I guess you're going to have to go up uh, as, as well. And the idea here is to raise your rates enough to be generous. Do not just bump them up to cover your costs. Raise them a little more so you can deliver more. Everybody is in the same boat. Everybody is being pressed by increasing costs from vendors, from food, from labor, from in energy. Um, and if they just bump it enough to, up enough to cover cost, they don't have any advantage. If you can bump yours up enough to be generous in what you deliver, 
you're going to bring an advantage. And we'll talk about why that's important as we move on to some of our other points. Mm-hmm. Ryan, your thoughts about this? Well, you know, I I don't disagree at all. I mean, um, and I'm going to take this down a slightly different road because I'm working with somebody who is um, helping people become, and I hate she hates the word gig to be better. I think that not only is an employee shortage, but I also think that there is a talent shortage, you know, and I think that one of the things that companies have to do is rethink the way that they're getting certain tasks done. You yes. don't need a full-time employee to do spreadsheets. Um, you know, you may, you may find ways to keep getting them to do spreadsheets. You know, hey, we need a spreadsheet on this. We need a spreadsheet on this. You know, is that productive? Is that helping to the bottom line? Is it helping your company be generous, as you say? But what if you could take a look at the tasks that you have in your business and say, you know what? We really need somebody who's really good at this, who could be more efficient at it and just do it when we need it. You know, yeah. it's I yes. think that um, I think part of it, too, is that we've been in an employment model where you hire people, you give them benefits to attract them, but you you're having a hard time keeping them you know, occupied with things that really hit the bottom line. So the thing I'm thinking is, you know, do we have to rethink the way that we're hiring people, you know, Absolutely. that we, we bring them in, too. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. I absolutely agree with you. That's one of my points on my my uh, list. You must have read ahead of a bit, my friend. And that is, <laughs> well, it's it's absolutely it makes sense. It just totally yeah. makes sense, right? We mm-hmm. have to completely review all of our systems, right? And there's there's five things that we need to look at. First of all, is what can we uh, simplify? Mm-hmm. Is there something we can just make simpler? Uh, like what can we eliminate? What is what can we get rid of? What mm-hmm. can we automate? What can we outsource? And then right. what can we insource? Insourcing is the last thing we want to do. So simplify, eliminate, automate, uh, insource, and then outsource. And if you remember, those were the three strategies for executive delegation that we talked about on the Bacon Podcast last season. Exactly. And, uh, so for listener, if you're if you want to dig into that a little more and figure out what's the process to do those five things, uh, go back and listen to the the one on how executives delegate without losing control. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Brian, I had a fantastic conversation about that. And it, it, you're absolutely spot on, my friend. That's that's what must be done. We have to rethink how we did business because business is no longer going to be as we expected. Right. And, uh, and, and that actually, your point leads to, to my second point, mm-hmm. which is that we need to take some of the money that we uh, are going to take from raising our rates and we have to turn that into team development. Mm -hmm. Most companies do not do solid team development. And I I mean, the idea here is if you really want to attract and keep good people, you have to create a career path within your organization, right? You have to show them the path to more money. And I don't mean two to 3% wage increases every year. I mean, you know, you're going to increase your capacity. We're going to increase your responsibility. We're going to increase your accountability and you're going to increase your wages 10% every year as you are able to bring more value to our company. And most people have not done talent development. It's It's been mm-hmm. an afterthought. And part of it is because talent development has been left to HR, which in some companies is actually the uh, initials for human remains. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're more about, uh, you know, HR tends to be more about compliance right. than human development. And mm-hmm. we've got to shift that has that must ship. If you want good people, you have to show them that working for you is good for their career and a ramp to consistently better wage. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, it, companies have to start thinking about human capital versus human resources. I mean, human resources is what you provide, but human capital is the investment you're making in your business, just like you do with anything else. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's right. And I've got, that's, it's, it's at least it's a step in the right direction. Right. Okay. So you, uh, you know, one of the things I love about interviewing you is you always help me come up with really cool things. (laughs) And so as you were talking about, we are a good team. Yeah. A couple of minutes ago, you were talking about it. And um, so here's here's my new theory. OK, um, during the pandemic, we had PPP, which stood for Payroll Protection Program. Right. 
Um, and that's what we need yeah. to do su to survive. We couldn't, you know, I, I just about everybody I know shut down their businesses in March and had to figure out what to do to kind of, you know, ride the tide through. And that definitely helped companies keep people paid and employed. And, you know, maybe it, it, it goes back to your original laziness side of things where people are getting paid to do nothing. You know, that may be the case. I, I, I don't disagree in the sense that it probably exposed some weaknesses. Um, but now that we're in kind of the post pandemic, uh, side of things, I would like to think of PPP as the post pandemic pivot. <laughs> I like it. It <laughs> must be a post pandemic pivot. That's right. Right. We yep. have to do so. Yeah. And in indeed. And in, in one of those pivots is we have to work on our customer service, mm -hmm. the quality of our customer service. That is going to be one of your key differentiators. We're seeing more and more uh, places that are doing customer self-service. Mm -hmm. You know, where you sit down at a restaurant, you pull out your phone, you shoot the QR code, and you place the order from your phone, and you don't see anybody until the food shows up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that really is no differentiation between Door DoorDash and sitting in somebody else's restaurant. And, right. and so there's no customer service. You know, people want to be entertained. People want to to come alive. People want to have a human interaction with somebody who's new and interesting and not and not boring. And and so customer service is going to be a major differentiator for those who survive and thrive and those who go the way of saying, we're just going to let the customer do it themselves. Now, don't get me wrong. Some people like customer self-service, but that's not where the money is. That's McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You can go to a kiosk sure. now, basically in order. Yeah, sure. Kiosk, you know, Wendy's, McDonald's, you know, when there's, when there's a, you know, when you're doing food, when you're doing hunger suppression, that might work. But when you're trying to uh, deliver something that a person's looking for that extra value, mm -hmm. the customer service is the piece that's there. And so what we have to do is teach our people uh, how to, how to anticipate customer needs, because that really is the element, the hallmark of good customer service is anticipate customer needs. And, and and I've been very sensitive to that. Yesterday we had a had a breakfast in a, a little local diner. In fact, I'm sitting right outside a little diner called the Rusted Spoon. They sell t-shirts in there, Brian. It says that spooning leads to forking. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm buying <laughs> buying one of those bad boys today. When I get done, my brother's in there having <laughs> breakfast. I'll join him when we're done here. But uh, just, I love that kind of, and, and the service has been extraordinary. They show up and they smile and mm -hmm. and ask us what we need and check on us a couple of times, right? It's the the, the stuff that you expect. And so we have to re, we have to re resur we have to resurrect customer service, which has mm -hmm. disappeared over the past eighteen months. Well, and and I think one of the, you know, there's a couple of different things that fall into that too, is um, the biggest companies, um, they tend to try to do the automated service first, you know, in other words, try the chat, you know, go to our Q&A and FAQ and try this, you know, and you ask a question, you know, you're going to ask a question that they can't answer, because that's why you're getting a hold of them to begin with. If you could just find it on the internet, you go find it on the internet. Um, the second thing that they do is they outsource all of their customer service overseas with scripts. So you're dealing with a bunch of people who can read, but can't think. And so now you're frustrated on top of frustrated on top of frustrated. And that to me is not customer service. That is anti-customer service. Like we don't want to talk to you. We're going to do put every barrier in between you getting your answer. You know, we want to give you your answer as fast as possible, but we don't want to pay to tell you what you need to know, you know that's essentially what they're saying. That's right. Yep, you're you're spot on. I think one of the differentiators between those who will thrive and those who will who may not survive mm -hmm. is that level of customer service. Because as prices increase rapidly, price no longer becomes a differentiator. Right. And we are in the heart of inflation. Let's go, and I'm seeing you know, prices that are that are substantially higher. I mean, uh, last season I was buying crab for 25 a pound. Now it's 35 a pound, and it's my all-time favorite food. So that's what I use for a treat. So, uh, but, but that's that's a substantial, it's, you know, it's a substantial increase in price. Right. And the same thing for it's meat. It's a third. And all those other items that we we need 
it's a third, right? 30%. So you better raise your prices at least 20, right? If you're going to cover yourself. Right. So that what that means is in, in the face of raising prices, price differentiation becomes way less of a differentiator. Instead, service differentiation becomes a, a prime differentiator, a service and quality. Right. So that, that's, a, I think it's really important for us to realize that is one of the big pivots is we lost service. You better bring it back and you br better bring it back uh, to a level that uh, your customers go, wow, this is really terrific because then the, mo the money doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, let's jump to, um, you know, kind of a side subject that I wanted to talk about today. And uh, I, I just love the fact that you're in Utah and there's motorcycles and birds oh, and all yeah. this other stuff. It's awesome. Um, because cows. that's it's American. Oh, cows, sheep. Yeah, goats. Goats are my new favorite um, <laughs> uh, things. And llamas, uh, which is a whole other story. <laughs> and, but, and it's cherry. It's cherry season here. The, the, the cherry ooh. trees are being harvested. Oh, yes. Wow. Sweet, ooh, cherries. Those, it's just... sweet cherries are awesome. I love sweet cherries. Anyway, carry, speaking carry of cherries. On. On my own. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, I think we could take that down a road of putting a cherry on top of something. So one of the things that I think that companies need to do, and this is just me, and, and I wanted to get your opinion on it and see what you thought, is a lot of companies spend a lot of time marketing themselves saying, hey, we've got the best widget. Our widget is better. Um, here's what you could do with our widget. You could save money with our widget. You can improve your life with our widget, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that I don't think that they do is I don't think they market to the lifestyle of the business. They, you know, obviously there's a difference between having a culture in an office and having a culture that is part remote work, part live work, you know, all those kind of things. And I think what companies have to do now is blend into their marketing mix uh, something about working for this company or stories, you know, celebrate your people, you know, in other yeah. words, you know, great customer service stories, um, why somebody is so happy working remotely with this company, what it affords them, they get the flexibility, but they still get paid. You know, what? what is it about the company that makes it stand out for its people? Because I, you know, one of the things that I focus on is relationship marketing. So I think that if you can put a face on the company to show people that might want to go work for you. First and foremost, you're assuming that they know who the heck you are and what you do, right? Um, you know, when if somebody's looking for a job, if you put it up on, you know, Monster or Career Builder or Indeed or LinkedIn or any of those things, you're assuming they already know what you do. But if they research you and they find nothing about your employees and all they find is your products, I think that you're missing the boat in, in being able to say, hey, this is a great place to work. Not only will you get paid well, but you're going to have, you know, an awesome opportunity to communicate. So, and we lost Mark for a minute. So uh, hopefully he'll be joining us back. He obviously is in a uh, very remote location. So I, I think that one of the things that companies should do in the meantime is look at their marketing plan and try to, um, try to figure out a way that you can get people to, you know, know more about you and what your business does and, and why it would be important for them to come work for you. And I'm trying to get Mark back on and here he is. And let's see, he's coming back slowly, but surely. But so uh, one of the things again, that I think is important is how do you promote your company, not only to your customers, but then how can you promote your company to, perspective employees. And, you know, it, obviously you're promoting it to vendors, but I think what you want to do is create that positive image about working at your company, the company culture, what makes a difference. You know, I think of something like Zappos or, or something along the lines of um, uh, Tom Shoes or Bomba Socks, you know, I mean, they, they one of the things that uh, a lot of millennials think about now is the reason that they work for certain companies is because they like their mission, you know, their mission to make the world a better place. And I think that's semi important to a lot of people and um, that getting people that's to, right. um, you know, creating a mission around getting people to understand that, you know, part of the money that you make is going to give free socks to people or give free shoes to people, or you're going to do something if they're into environmental or if they're into, you know, I mean, it could even go down political roads. If you, your company is really based on trying to make change in a political way, you know, no matter what your belief is, 
that may be the thing that attracts people. So the question to you, Mark, is how do we market our companies effectively to let, you know, potential employees know what we do, not just our customers? That's right. You're, you're absolutely spot on. I believe you're, you, you've got it nailed there. And that is to, to show that the company does things that are meaningful and that the work that they will do is meaningful. And th that is a big uh, challenge that our younger workforce is, uh, is attempting to do is finding meaning in their work versus just finding, you know, working to live versus living to work. Right. And, um, and what can we do? How can they make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. And we're going to be seeing a lot of that. Um, uh, really, it's about integrity, personal integrity, authenticity. Mm -hmm. Can they be authentic? Can they be themselves within the work environment? And while, you know, in the past, uh, millennials like me resisted uh, seeing but rather boomers like me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> millennial, millennial and harp, uh, boomer and body. Uh, boomers like me would resist seeing millennials with uh, you know, boys with black painted fingernails and, and uh, crazy color hair. Well, now it's like, oh, well, that's just, you know, that's just who they are. I've, right. I've certainly gotten over that and welcome, I welcome their self-expression. And I, I think part of it is letting them be authentic, but we also need to make sure that we, uh, we have integrity from an organization. Mm -hmm. Um, Millennials and Z-Gen are really good at sniffing out inauthenticity. Yep. If they don't believe that you're walking your talk, they'll just, you know, they'll just pick up and leave and throw a handful of salt and whatever you're working on right now. <laughs> well, and, and the so, other thing I want to, I want to jump in on this convo because I mean, I have two millennials. I have a, a 34 and a 36 year old. And the, the thing is, is that my initial feeling was they don't understand life. Um, they don't own, my daughter doesn't own a car. She rents a, an apartment that is as expensive as my house. And I'm going, mm -hmm. why would you pay the same amount of money for an apartment that I'm paying for a house? I own this, you know, I was, we're, we're taught to, you know, go get a job, get an education, and then you get these possessions and then you can retire and all these other things. And uh, honestly, as I start to get older, I'm starting to realize how damn smart they are because oh, okay. I... I had to drop, you know, $30,000 on replacing the windows on my house and it's a money pit. So they don't have to do that. You know, she doesn't need a car. She's got public transportation. She doesn't need the expense of the, you know, doing those things. And then they have the freedom to do what they want. So if they do make as much money as we do, they have more money to go enjoy life and take vacations and do things that I can't do because I'm so busy paying for all the damn things that I bought years ago. <laughs> and so... Their, you know, their yep. mindset is very different and I'm beginning to understand it more. And so that's, that's part of the deal too, is they are not attached to anything like we were. I mean, our, our concept was you go to a company, you stay there for life. Their idea is you don't have to stay anywhere for life. Bottom line is if I don't like this company, I'll go find another job. I don't need as much money to survive on a regular basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah, but the, you know, millennials were raised in an environment where loyalty didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. They saw that in their parents. They saw that with their friends' parents. They saw friends and uh, their parents lose uh, houses and cars and possessions. Mm -hmm. And they saw the angst that brought. And their wise little self said possessions, including houses, are not fun to have. And, of course, I've made that transition. I don't own a house. I own zero property. Most people at my age own a lot of property. I don't own any property. Mm -hmm. I live in air. I live in Airbnbs. I pull up, plug in, enjoy my life there for a month, leave, and there's zero maintenance, zero utility bills. And other than a car payment and insurance payment, I don't have any other commitments. Okay, mm -hmm. I have a cell phone payment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but, and and I'm free. I'm absolutely free to, to to go anywhere I want, and I'm no longer possessed by my possessions. So from that standpoint, I get their heart. I get what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And and we're going to have to allow that to happen. And we can't denigrate them we cannot abuse them we cannot say they're stupid because i think they're actually smarter than the average bear but i think that's, that's part, part of the, of the that's part the of the culture shift. right that's part of the change in the culture that i think that we have to get used to and especially if we're going to try to attract them into our company and we also have to get used to the fact that they may come and go and that's okay oh, yeah. 
You know, I mean, it's it's our mindset says, wait a minute, did what what could have we done better to keep them here? And the answer to that is nothing. You know, nothing. It, it, well, there, yeah. there's a good there's there's a good example of that. I my my uh, middle son, my I, my youngest son. He's not my I have a middle daughter and a youngest son there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he has he has a fan he has a fantastic job with routine uh, promotions because of his capacity. Mm -hmm. He's quitting his job in August to go to Spain for six months and there's nothing they can offer him to make him stay mm -hmm. nothing not a promotion not a raise nothing mm -hmm. he is going to experience spain with his girlfriend he's going to teach english because he knows he can come back and get a job anytime he wants right we have to deal with that we right. just have to deal with that right and while it's counter to the culture you and i were raised in it's where we are it's what we have to adapt to. It's mm -hmm. what we have to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you touched on this other subject that I wanted to talk about too, and that is remote work forces us to think differently. And I've learned this through my business is, you know, I built my business um, based on having people that will come in. It, like I was talking about before, somebody who does spreadsheets. I've got somebody who does spreadsheets for analytics, for Google analytics. And she comes in, she does the client work, she sends me the you know reports and she sends me a bill and that's awesome. But the key thing that I'm learning is if I'm going to, with her, it, it's awesome. I, I don't have to do anything, I, she just delivers. But what if she left? Okay, do I have anything in place? Do I have a system in place? that says, this is what's expected. You know, I can show somebody a report, but say, this is the why behind the how. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is why you do what you do. Just don't follow that formula. I want you to bring your unique talents and, and, and vision and expertise to this. So us as business owners have to start documenting processes differently. We have to get used to the fact that this may be, you know, a shorter term excursion, it, that it could be that we need to change people more often, but we have to have those systems in place. And that includes, you know, things like Slack, like Dropbox, like Zoom, like all these other tools. And we have to teach our people how to use those. I mean, everybody's gotten on Zoom, but not everybody knows where all the buttons are, where the mute button is, you know, how to turn the camera off at the right time. I mean, they may know it, but <laughs> they may not do it in the middle of a meeting, which could cost you business. You know, if you're relying on them to do that, you need to have a system around teaching them how to do that. So what are your thoughts in that direction? Uh, I think that's part of the training conversation that we, we spoke about earlier. We have to do human development. We have to put people on a track. Uh, and unfortunately, um, our, our younger, um, employees were not well trained when it came to social skills. Mm -hmm. Our school system has absolutely let us down when it comes to fundamentals of of social skills and interacting and how do you how do you behave and what are the expectations and and unfortunately we also see that in the entertainment today on mm -hmm. television. Um, entertainment is, is based on making fun of people and making making uh, parents look stupid and making the boss look stupid and you know, they, so there's been a lot of bad 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 training and bad examples and we have to turn that around we have to we have to teach people we used to call them soft skills but they're mm -hmm. essential skills and it just becomes part of it and the way that we can position this and i think this is an important distinction is talk about the brand experience when people come to the in, to come to your company they expect a certain level of communication quality of customer service quality of product quality and that's part of the brand experience <clears throat> which causes them to come back mm -hmm. and if you put to if you put that training the brand experience training together with you know this is a way for you to get consistently increased um, uh, wages and salary because you're going to bring more and more value to our company and part of that value you bring is this consistent brand experience so it's a combination of training cultural training skills training and brand uh, training. And uh, I think that's an important component for right now as we get restarted is for uh, for all business owners to have a complete brand experience review mm -hmm. and look for any way you possibly can to increase the quality of that brand experience. One thing I'm seeing on a regular basis is because we don't have we, we don't have the training, we don't have the employees, we're getting brand experience, we're getting brand slaughter. 
mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. uh, D David Gruder's term for what happens when the brand does not deliver on its promise. And brand slaughter can be permanent. Today, it can be permanent. Mm -hmm. And you won't get those people back. You'll never get them back. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Um, Good. I, I, had I knew you have one. Oh, yeah. I had AT&T for my cell phone forever. And the reason I used AT&T is because I worked with AT&T back in the 1980s. That was the company I worked for. So I had this, you know, vision in my head loyalty. of supporting the old company, loyalty, all that kind of stuff, right? And so midstream a month ago, my wife says, I keep getting these notices that I'm using all this data. And I said, well, let me look into it. So I looked into it and I said, well, you're not using any data. I looked at the bill and all this other stuff. And what I finally figured out is I was using the data. I have been walking my dog for a year listening to audiobooks. And then all of a sudden, I started getting hit with $15 bills. You're over. You know, you, you we're going to give you another gig. Here's 15 bucks. Here's 15 bucks. Here's 15 bucks. And, oh, yeah. you know, my bills started going up. And I called up the first time and they said, well, you know, we have new plans and you can get one for $150 a month. And it went from 90 to $150 for the same thing. I was getting the same thing that I had before. It's like, wait a minute, what happened? So I went and did a little research and I found out that T-Mobile has a better plan with free Netflix for the same price I was paying before with no taxes and fees. So I went to AT&T and yeah. I said, hey, um, you know, this is what they're offering me. What do you guys have that's similar? And they say, well, we don't have anything similar. I said, well, what can you do about these $15 charges if I upgrade to that $150 fee? We can do nothing about it. I said, okay, how do I disconnect my service? At that point, I walked <laughs> over to T-Mobile, brought my two phones in. Within an hour, I had switched and I'd saved $80 a month when it was all said and done. And so there's yep. an example of the brand experience. Slaughter. It brand slaughter. I will, And not only did I not... You know, well, I never go back to them because now I'm with T-Mobile and I love T-Mobile. Um, and I never knew that T-Mobile was as good as it was. And then the second thing is, is that I made sure that the Internet knew my friends of the example of what happened to me, you know, and saying right. that. A and then a lot of people came on and said, oh, yeah, AT&T changes plans and doesn't tell you anything. And they did the same thing to me. Oh, they did the same thing to me. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting this crowdsourcing of AT&T doesn't give a damn about its customers. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's brand slaughter, brand, brand slaughter. For, my brother had the same experience. And mm -hmm. uh, he walked into a T-Mobile store, walked out with a new phone and a $150 contract commitment for three months, unlimited data. And he owned the phone after the end of three months and they would unlock it. And he was like, why the heck would I ever pay attention to AT&T? And uh, so, you know, there's, we're seeing this, this brand slaughter over and over again. And a big part of it has to do with you know, people are trying to do the best they can with what they've got. They're raising their fees, but they're not raising their customer service. They're not giving people ways of making the transition. And so I think that's a great example of all the points we're talking about today as mm -hmm. we pivot post-pandemic into what do we do now uh, to make sure that we thrive. And so that brand slaughter component is a really important, great story, my friend. Thank you. And uh, the, uh, the seventh point that I have here is that it's time for us to review our marketing. Mm -hmm. And we need to review our marketing through the eyes of a jaundiced customer, mm -hmm. a customer who is skeptical, a customer who is tired and sick and doesn't believe your hype. And we have to come at it from how can we adjust our marketing to appeal to those who we want to do business with. And I know that you're, that's your core business. Yep. And a lot of people's marketing has gone has gone from a website to a cob website over the past 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it's time for that to change. But you have to take a look at it through your customer's eyes. Yep. And then the second part of the exercise is to take a look at all your competitors through your customer's eyes. Not saying, oh, they can't do that. Oh, what are they talking about? That makes you completely blind. That creates blind spots. Mm -hmm. Instead, look for those elements that you go, man, if I was a customer, I'd say that's pretty freaking cool. I'd like, I'd like that. that. Right. looks fun. So, I, so some, you know, if you've got some rundowns on some ways of quickly uh, doing a marketing audit, yeah, that um, would be valuable. I think that would be powerful here. We got to do that. Well, I, I think the marketing audit is first and foremost is are is your marketing thinking one step ahead of the customer? Hackers always right on. think one step ahead of the people trying to stop the hacks. 
So you have to basically promote a vision that they don't know exists. I'll give an example of this. One of my customers wrote an ebook about the six technologies you need to know about. All right. And one of these technologies that we're actually doing, and, and you may not know this, and I didn't know this until I talked with them about this, is in I didn't realize that in the NFL, they have something called MotionWorks, which is owned by a company called Zebra. And MotionWorks, basically, there are microchips. There are RFID microchips in footballs, in helmets, and in refs. And the data that they're finding on the field, when you see how far a pass went, how fast somebody ran something, where the ball ended up, I mean, all of these other things is all data that's being captured. That same technology can be used in warehouses and in, in, in supply chain issues and all these other things. And so when you're thinking about right now, we're in the middle of a big supply chain issue. How can this help companies you know, overcome some of those issues and better optimize their operations in the future, right? So that's one of the six technologies. And so they're they're thinking ahead for the customer saying, this is something you need to know about that is coming down the pike. And so that is one of the first audits that you have to do is, are we out in front of what our competition is doing? So let me let you ramble on that one. What do you think? No, no right on, absolutely spot on. Uh, and you're going to do this a couple of ways. One, you're going to do it internally, and you're also going to do it externally. You need to be uh, you need to be interviewing new vendors. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs to be considering new vendors, regardless of your experience, regardless of your um, your loyalty. And part of the reason why is you don't know if they're going to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're going to enter into a very rapid regrowth phase. The rubber band's been pulled back really tight, and people are wanting to spend money. I I, I had the most horrendous experience last night. Mm -hmm. I stayed at a at a um, at a hotel hotel chain that used to be quite popular, but is not very not very common anymore. And rhymes with the orange and blue, and <laughs> and uh, they tend to, to serve they they serve to, to to serve they tend to serve hoes and johns. Ah, and I paid 120. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. And I paid 125 dollars last night to stay in one of their rooms that should have been 15. And the prices have gone up so much and the thing that was crazy is is it was it, every place right now is extremely expensive motel sixes are in the three digits which is insane you know and when i'm out adventuring i don't mind because i'm just wanting a place to shower and sleep and of course i'd never bring my sweetie to a place like that but even even you know hampton inns are now in the 300 dollar range out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and so you're going to see the, the point is that you're going to see vendors having to increase prices to keep up with demand and all those the all of the things that happened so you're going to need to have some alternatives and uh so uh make sure that you do have alternative vendors in mind mm -hmm. including those with better technology including those that have a better delivery uh, including those that have better customer service including the fact that if you have a mission critical vendor that if they fail, you are in trouble, you could be out of business too. And so we have to take a look at these dependencies and we have to add some redundancy to our system. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, one of the things that the, the, the pandemic has illustrated very clearly is many companies have brittle systems. Mm -hmm. They're easily broken. I, it's crazy, we can walk into Walmart and there's still our share, shelves that are bare Yep. because there's not enough product in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And this is just absolutely insane. And so we have to take a look at our, our business and identify the brittleness in the system. Because the way that you're going to make massive amounts of money going forward is to be nimble. And nimbility comes from a combination of willingness to innovate and lack of brittleness, otherwise known as resiliency within mm -hmm. your organization. If you can't innovate, if you can't innovate and your systems are brittle, you are doomed. But if you can be resilient and you can innovate, you will thrive. Okay, so now you just scared the crap out of every B2B business out there that every other company should start looking for another uh, company. And I want to help kind of smooth that over a little bit because you just brought the fear of, of God into everybody. <clears throat> and that is to help yourself not be caught up in that and have people start leaving you. Let, you know, having, having employees leave you is bad. Having customers leave you is very bad. 
Um, but in order for you, yes. part of your marketing strategy has to be how do you communicate with your current and past customers? And that has to be so yes. integrated into your sales team. It has to be integrated into your day-to-day -day business in a way that you've never done it before. And one of the things that I teach yes. is something called, uh, I call it Tribe. It's my new system. It, it's the same system I've been using it. I've just been really honing it down. And that is that every salesperson in your team has 150 unique contacts and they need to connect with them every single month, 12 times a year. If they're not reaching out to them saying, how are you doing? Are you still there? What are your needs? What are your problems? What's going on? And then they need to collect that intelligence and bring it back and, and have a collective knowledge about what the customers are saying, what they're worrying about. So that you can preemptively go back. You know what? You brought up a really good point and here's what we're doing about it. So next time you communicate with them, you actually have an answer to the problems that they're telling you. And if you're not documenting this, if you're not putting it into a CRM system, a, a Slack, or some kind of management system where everything can be pooled, you're missing a huge opportunity to communicate and that has to be formalized. What do you think? Spot on. Absolutely spot on. That's going to help decrease your brittleness, at least in terms of understanding what's going on with your customers. You know, Brian, you've seen this uh, without a doubt in some of your clients as I have mm -hmm. in mine, that the, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So you have one client that makes a lot of noise, but really doesn't represent the market or other clients. And when customers say, you know, I'm having this challenge, the first thing I ask them is what percentage of your customers are, are exhibiting this particular problem? And they'll say, ah, maybe it's maybe 5%. I said, ignore it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you know, anything less than 10% is just, that's, that's just the noise of the bell-shaped curve. Right. Or 80-20 rule is a good way to look at it too, is if you get up to that 20%, you know, critical mass, now you're talking about something substantial. You know, or, but you know, the other the point of that is that 80-20 rule also indicates that 20, 80% of our headaches come from 20% of our customers, just right. like 80% of our profits come from 20% of our profits. The question is, what end of that spectrum are you going to focus your attention on? So part of that has to be triage. Mm -hmm. We have to pay attention. Yet, yet what you, you just set up was uh, those 150 people that that salesperson talks to every month is part of the data set that's going to help us figure out where we have to pay attention and where we need to add more resources. Right. And what we need to ignore, you know, just because one person has a problem brings Spot it up, you might on. jump down that, you know, jump down that rabbit hole. And the next thing you know, you're eating carrots, right? Um, <laughs> which isn't so bad, right. um, you know, if you like carrots. But or, I, or bunny ahead. pellets. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, my dog. Or bunny those. pellets. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, she likes going hunting for those in the grass. Um, but that's a whole nother story. And, it, it, you know, especially since you're about to eat breakfast, <laughs> I don't want to go down that road. You're going to look at the sausage and go, oh, I can't eat that. <laughs> uh -huh. no. uh, but um, so back no. to the. I, um, I raised five kids. I can eat anything. Carry yeah, on. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so back to the, you know, so the core thing that we're talking about, too, is, you know, is understanding that we have to we have to adapt our businesses to the models that are in front of us. And I think that, you know, one of the things that companies tend to do is they tend to get caught up in that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. When in reality, you really have to be much more in tune to listening. You have to be into the, you know, tune to your customers and WIAFM, what's in it for me. And so I, I think that listening to your customers, you know, core putting some correlation based on what they're saying. Like you said, the 80-20 rule, you know, you get the squeaky wheels and all that other stuff, but you have to have a system in place to be able to deal with it. You know, it's like, okay, let's, let's put this on a board. What's, you know, what's important, what's not important, you know, those kind of things. And uh, so what does management need to think about? What do people need to think about in this realm and how do they find people to come in and help them change the model of their business? So it matches what we're talking about today. What, you know, like for example, um, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you never heard of a CIO, you know, as a chief information officer. I mean, do we need a, um, uh, CC, what would it be? Um, yeah, it would be a CCSO. Okay. A chief customer service operations, you know, m manager. Do we need to reinvent well, some of the positions that we have or, or do we reallocate those to other people? That brings up an interesting conversation. Most of the people in the C-suite shouldn't be there because the C-suite needs to be completely strategic and not at all tactical. 
And right now I'm in the middle of writing a book with Dr. David Gruder called The Nimble C-Suite, How to Align the Diverse Strengths of Your Executive Team to uh, Deliver Predictable, Extraordinary Results in Upheavals in, in Acquisitions and Beyond. And in the research that we're doing for, for the book, uh, the conversation, the C-suite actually needs to be reduced down to five functions. Many mm-hmm. of the C-suite people that are in there are not, they're not strategic. They're tactical. And the blend of the strategic and the tactical into those roles causes a lot of confusion and a lot of challenges. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to customer service, customer service is the purview of the chief operations officer. And the reason why is because the operations officer has to deliver what the salespeople have sold. And, and so therefore, customer service is a direct feedback and the quality of the operation. So C, COO is responsible for customer service. Most but the question I have for you is, way. do they do that, though? I mean, in most companies, does the COO think of themselves as a customer service manager? If, well, they're not necessarily a manager. They have somebody working for them who's a customer service manager. Right. Um, in, a larger, but, in a larger organization. But you have to realize as an operations officer, you're supposed to operate to deliver customer service. And you're responsible for profit and loss because you're responsible for the, the, all the assets that deliver what your company sells. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and if they, if they haven't done it, then that's a problem. Right. Well, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, do COOs, you know, I, I don't work with them, so I don't know if they really think strategically down that road, you know, that customer service is not just an expense. It's a, it's a part of a bigger picture of the operation. Uh, well, yes. And it's also a KPI, mm-hmm. um, you know, for a COO, the, the KPI, one of the KPIs is our customer satisfied with what we're delivering because a, a COO has to be responsible for the infrastructure for how we deliver what's sold. Mm-hmm. And that's what the operations are all about. Right. Um, now, a, a, a lot of them do understand that they're responsible for customer service, but there's a lot of them that don't understand they're, they're responsible for customer service. But you have to have the direct feedback to the operation of how you deliver it, of mm-hmm. how it's constructed, how the quality is in, installed and inspected. All of those, pe- all those things are part of the operation. So uh, if, if you're having customer service issues, there's probably because there is a disconnect between mm-hmm. operations and the customer service department. And I think that's what you experienced with AT&T. Yes. AT&T said, there's nothing we can do. Well, if the COO knew that they're losing customers left and right because of the operation, their responsibility for P&L would be all over that. So there's a clear cut between those functions. So, you know, part of it is you've got to do some smarter uh, design of your organization. And um, in, in, the, in the book, we talk about the reduced C-suite. And we actually add a new suite called the T-suite, which is tactical. Mm-hmm. You need to have people who are, who are, you know, tactical, but also have responsibility and accountability in, direct, in a director kind of role but they can separate the tactics from the strategies and, and keep a, keep that a whole lot cleaner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that and may that, be something to consider. Yeah. I, I can see this reinvention of, you know, the way that companies are run because I mean, the models are changing, the people are changing, the atmosphere is changing and, and, you know, the old, um, the old way of doing business isn't going to stick around too, too much longer, especially with, um, I mean, the biggest problem with supply chain right now is the fact that we built the it's not a United States problem. It's a world problem. And the thing is, is that, you know, some companies, Absolutely. you know, the, it, it's not that the companies can't produce things here. It's just they can't get a component. And so, the you know, for example, paper. Um, you know, obviously, there's a, a big paper shortage right now, lumber shortage, those kind of things. Um, A lot of it has to do with, you know, some of the factory shut down, you know, whatever that is, that's one piece of it. But then if you take paper down to labels, 
you know, is it um, is it the paper that's the problem? Is it the glue that's the problem? Is it the you know backed thing that you put the label on? The the basically consider it wax paper that you put it on. Is it the stuff you wrap it in? Is it the parts that you need for me? You know, there's so many different places where these things can break down. And it's because it's this bigger, bigger picture that, you know, we don't understand, at least as a consumer, we don't understand. We can't get labels because, you know, we think the label companies suck right now and they're having problems delivering. It's not them. It's it's what they're getting supplied with or parts are missing or, or you know, those kind of things. So the last question, yeah, and that's which just goes back to the, the comment. Go ahead. Yeah, which goes back to the comment is you've got to have resilience. You have, if your system is brittle, where your company falls apart because one vendor can't deliver, you're going to be goner. We have right. to add resilience to our organization. Carry on, please. No, no, and because we've got five minutes left, and I want to answer this one last question, and that is: is based on everything that we talked about today, what um, what conversation do companies need to have about with themselves and with the the general public about attracting new good people? to come into the roles that we're talking about that help them become resilient and grow into the future. I, I think, I think it really is all about when you talk to people, say what's important to you, mm -hmm. how can we line up your motivation with our company? You know, half of your success as an employer is going to be employee motivation and maintaining that motivation. Mm -hmm. And 40% of your success is going to be the relationship you have with you, with them. Do they trust you? Do they believe you're authentic? And as a, as leaders, we have to, we have to display authenticity. We have to, we have to generate synergy. Mm -hmm. So how can we synergize with these people instead of giving them orders? How can we work with their mind and how they think and tap into their knowledge of, of how their peers think and how can we then help them guide us to, to better deliver what their peers want and then ultimately deliver that into a system. So it's authenticity, synergistic synergy and systems, which other me otherwise spells ass. So we got to get off <laughs> our ass and get going. God, I love that more than you could possibly imagine. Um, the other thing, and this, just, <laughs> this just popped into my head. And one of, one of the things that I think that we have to do is, or, or companies have to do, is you have to be able to provide, if you're going to attract great people, you have to provide them with basically a, a menu of choices as to what is going to make them happy. So an example of bringing somebody on board you get them on board and say, okay, we're going to pay you 50,000 bucks. All right. You know, that's, but here's your suite. You get the choice of, you get two weeks vacation. And instead of getting raises, we'll give you an additional day based on performance. So you can actually get up to three months time off to do what you want. So you can actually earn days off. And that will be part of your compensation package. You can earn um, additional um, benefits, as in health benefits for your family. You can earn, um, you know, cars, or, or it, it's almost like you could earn um, uh, points, you know, and, and trying to get people to understand they can earn all different kinds of things based on the performance and based on the way the business is structured. And that to me, I think is one of, is going to be one of the things is that we have to offer a suite of different opportunities for people to achieve things or collect um, what's valuable to them and let them pick and choose what's going to be important to them. And I think that's really, you know, you have to make your company adaptable. You have to make the, the way that you serve the people that are coming in adaptable, because I grew up in a system where here is, you know, here's what you're you get, you get these benefits, you get this, you know, you're going to get a pension, you're going to get this X amount of weeks off. And if you stay this long, you get this, it's very systemized, but it's not very flexible based on the number of people that come in. So uh, Mark is uh, having a little bit of challenge, but um, that's just a concept that I think that, you know, we're going to have to look at as business owners is how we compensate people. How do we get them to buy into the kinds of things that, 
you know, I don't know how much you heard of what I just talked about. What I said is basically you have to offer a menu of services of what they can earn inside the business. They can earn additional health benefits. They can earn additional time off. They can earn additional money. They can earn whatever it is they want. And you're going to have to create a system that's flexible to attract people in saying it's, it's, it's a, you know, you pick and choose. Basically you pick the things that you want and we're going to be able to adapt to that rather than having this rigid, you get X amount of time off, you get X amount of bonuses. This is the way you get promoted, that kind of stuff. Would you agree? Right, Brian, in that we have to make sure that we deliver what people are motivated for. And mm -hmm. so for some people it is health benefits for others. They don't care about health. They're on their parents' health care plan until they're 27. Right. Uh, so, you know, the rules have changed a lot. And one of the things I would also add to that list is paying people for outcome versus hours. So mm -hmm. essentially turning them into contractors where, you know, we'll pay you um, we'll, we'll pay you $5,000 to deliver this particular outcome. And the faster you get it, the more yep. you'll get paid by the right, hour. Exactly. And mm -hmm. So Yep. And uh, you're breaking up a little bit because of the go ahead. You're breaking up a little bit, but go ahead. All right. I don't know if you could still hear me, but that's one of the um that's one of the things that I work on my business is I, I give people a set amount of time to do something. Um, and, but my goal is to teach them how to do it faster. So I pay them the same amount and get them to do it over and over again. The faster they get at it, they basically can double, you know, say it takes them an hour to do one thing the first time they do it. Next time it takes 45 minutes. Next time it takes a half hour. Basically what they're doing is they're doubling their salary by getting better at it. And that to me is a, a great motivational piece. And um, so I'm going to see if we can get Mark back. It's 1101. But if you guys, I'm going to do this. Let me, because um, Mark is obviously having some technical difficulties. He, he is out in a remote space. Oh, he is back. Let's see if we can get it back on. There he is. All right, yeah, brother. So we'll, what I'm going to do we'll, we'll is see. I'm going to give you a but chance. Yeah, I'll give you a chance to uh, go ahead and let people know how they want to get a hold of you. And um, yeah, we'll pull up your banner and that kind of stuff and, and let them know about Bijo. Bijak company and that kind of stuff. So go ahead and tell people if they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Quite frankly, the best way to get a hold of me is let's connect on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, Marks on LinkedIn.com, M A R K S on LinkedIn.com takes you directly to my LinkedIn profile. Say, hey, I saw you speak to Mr. Brian Bacon Basilico. <laughs> I want to let's let's talk and I'll give anybody 20 minutes of my time to have a conversation about what's what's on your mind and what you're trying to accomplish and see if there's a reason for us to uh, take it further from there. And um, I'm always glad to show, share pictures of my adventures. Yes, and, and I I love it. I so appreciate you. I know you had uh, you know your plans. You jumped in the last minute because we had. Uh, I know you're out and about doing stuff. But man, it's always a pleasure talking to you. I always learn a lot. I get some great ideas. Likewise, my friend. I hope people got something Likewise. out of this. Definitely have a conversation with this man. That's one of the reasons why I interview him so much because I want to keep learning from you. And, uh, and that, and I do, every time I talk to you, I learn something new. And again, you came up with my new thing, the PPP, the post pandemic pivot. So we had PPP before PPP <laughs> after, and that is my takeaway for today. And, uh, that is way too many P's my friend. So we've talked about P and we've talked uh, about ass today. So those are my two big takeaways. Well, yeah, we talked about spooning and fork, and it's just been an adult uh, kind of uh, conversation. It has, today. yes, uh, and it's always fun. It is always fun. So anyways, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to do our bacon and coffee closeout. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Share the replays at liforsales.com. You can always find me at linktree, which is l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e forward slash bacon guy. All my contacts are there if you want to see the replays. Mark, have an awesome day. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you so much. All right. You too. I appreciate you too, Brian. Happy trails. All right. And uh, enjoy your week, everybody. All right. Thanks, my friend. I'm going to go get some bacon. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee.